all filmmakers, good filmmakers, make films for themselves and for their peers. Okay, so a big portion, and, and this is something that has never been uh, addressed when talking about Soviet cinema. Everybody just assumes politics penetrates everything, but the fact that art also penetrates everything, at least for these people, that has not been argued. So they're making movies for themselves. They're making movies for Sergei Eisenstein. So Sergei Eisenstein is an international celebrity uh, a very well-known uh, filmmaker, a fantastic filmmaker. And so everyone who's making films under in Russia knows that Eisenstein is going to see their film. And it, so it ha they have to make sure their film is high quality and interesting to someone like Eisenstein or to their own peers. And at the same time, they need to pass the political censorship. The clip you just heard was Maria Bello Dubrovskaya, Associate Professor in the Department of Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago, explaining how Soviet filmmakers in the 1930s and 40s approached their work. It's part of an interview that Sean Guillory recorded for his show, SRB Podcast, but he has kindly agreed to let me share the whole conversation with you here on the Roos Files Unite podcast feed. Sean is Digital Scholarship Curator at the Center of Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. After the interview, I'll be giving you an update on what's going on with the show. But in the meantime, please enjoy this fascinating discussion of how movies were made under some of the most challenging circumstances imaginable. You begin your book, Not According to Plan, by presenting some of our assumptions about Soviet filmmaking. So I thought we'd start by having you lay out what some of those assumptions are. Yeah, so there's a standard story which basically uh, suggests that in about 1928, uh, Stalin comes to power. And in 1930, Soviet film institutions are put under one centralized authority. And so because that happens, every single book on Soviet cinema will tell you that this, uh, this means that Soviet cinema becomes bureaucratized that it starts lacking creative freedom, there is overwhelming rule of censorship, there's central planning of production, and the party apparatus, including uh, Stalin himself, uh, becomes, gets to be in charge of cinema. Now, this conclusion is completely intuitive if you just uh, know that uh, Stalin does indeed consolidate power in the early 30s, that central cinema administration is indeed formed, that socialist realism is uh, introduced in 1934, and the films, moreover, themselves do look different in the 30s because the radical avant-gardism of the 20s Soviet montage does decline in the 30s. So it's very easy to come to this conclusion. However, what attracted me to this story is that uh, very early in my experience of watching Soviet films and thinking about Soviet films, I saw a film from 1936 called uh, a Strict Young Man, or Strogi Yunusha in Russian, uh, by Abram Rohn. And 1936, to me, was a year when all of this is already in place. Censorship, bureaucracy, socialist realism, no creative freedom, Stalin is watching every film. And I'm watching this film, and I see that this film has nothing to do with social realism, that it's a completely avant-gardist uh, project with completely absurd characters and situations that has ex is experimenting with sound, uh, and that instead of being a social realist film, it is really more like a parody of social realism. And so when I saw that, so for, to me, the, the kind of the standard story of control, top-down control, and this film, on the other hand, that has some, doesn't seem to accord at all with the story of control, uh, that put this question on the agenda of how is it possible that a film that is so far from conforming to what is supposedly the mainstream of Soviet cinema is produced in 1936. And this is not the only, like, you, you would think it's an exception, but it is, turns out it's not an exception. There are many films that were like this, similar to this, that were made uh, around this time in the mid-1930s. And um, so how is it possible that the Soviet, that Soviet cinema, Soviet filmmakers are producing these films uh, 
Some of them are banned, some of them are not banned. Like The Strict Young Man was banned, but some other films that are similar to it uh, were not. Uh, how is that possible under this top-down controlled system that films like that get made and sometimes even released? So that was my starting intuition that something was off, that the standard story cannot explain what the facts on the ground that we see. Let me ask you a question about this issue of socialist realism, because I, from my limited reading of literary scholars on socialist realism, one of the things that they've pointed out is that socialist realism didn't necessarily have a really strict, defined aesthetic, that it, it was worked out by creating parameters of, of what a socialist novel is supposed to be like. Um, and and through criticism and and sometimes you get you know things that are produced that aren't socialist realists and and so do you get a sense too of this issue just the socialist realist aesthetic of film do you get a, a similar type of everybody is supposed to make socialist realist films but nobody is really clear on what that's supposed to be so there are these five pillars of socialist realism like tendentiousness or ide ideological soundness and party-mindedness and people-mindedness. There are several of them. And all of these have to do with the content, you could say, or with the message, the ultimate message of a film. Very little of this other than that the film or literary work, whatever, has to be accessible to broad mass masses of Soviet people other than that requirement, accessibility, there is nothing aesthetically demanded. So that is true, certainly. And I would say that's a major loophole that filmmakers explored. So it's a matter of the fact that the aesthetic policy is not laid down exactly, and who is supposed to be making these socialist realist works. So in lit and the difference between film and literature here is that in literature, they do actually have an army of new writers who enter uh, the uh, literature, Soviet literature, and start writing, and are more willing to write in ways that are more, you know, conformist and conventional. Whereas in film, that not never actually happens. So the people who are making movies in the twenties, the avant-gardists from the nineteen twenties, continue to make films through the Stalin period. And this is actually one answer to the question of how a completely avant-gardist film could be made in 1936 and later on too is because it's this there's no generational change the the people who make the films are the same people or at least the leaders of the the, the main talent is the same people right right yeah we'll, we'll talk about this kind of overarching oh, this really strong influence of these film masters in the 1930s but but first before we get to that as you point out, and many have pointed out over the years, that Lenin famously called film one of the most important of all the arts. So what was the role of, of film as propaganda, but more interestingly, as entertainment in building Soviet socialism? So one thing about this phrase, the most important of the arts, is that we don't actually know for fact that Lenin said it. Right? The, the phrase comes down to us through others who supposedly talked to Lenin. So there's no written record of him actually uttering these words. So, But let's assume that he said that. Assuming that he said that, you have to understand where Lenin is coming from. What he's talking about is the fact that the, so, the Russia is an agrarian, illiterate country. And so film is the most important of the arts because you don't need literacy to understand film. So in this kind of sense, and only in this sense, does he mean this to be the most important of the arts. He certainly doesn't think it's the most important of the arts in all respects. Like, and if you think about what happens later, Stalin pays a lot more attention to literature and theater and only then film. Literature is the art that they seem to be uh, interested in controlling. And Katrina Clark has written about this, that there seemed to have been this belief that if you can control the written word, the word, then you can control the population. Uh, and film was not part of that system. So, so there's, first of all, what Lenin meant and whether he said this or not, there's that. So another thing that has come down from what Lenin said is in this, this is in the same 
uh, record that has been recalled of the conversation that people were having with Lenin was the Leninist proportion. So the Leninist proportion is that you need to have a combination of entertainment films and propaganda films because Lenin very realistically knew that audiences are not going to go for pure propaganda all of a sudden when they were being used to being entertained in theaters. And so what he said was show people entertainment films just so that you attract them to the theaters. And then on top of it or along with it, show them propaganda films that educate them in ways that are beneficial uh, to the regime. Okay, so and then the question becomes... Um, so you said what 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 role film played as propaganda or as edu as entertainment in um, in building Stalinism, say, and I would say that we don't actually know what role it played because in order to study this, it's an empirical question, right? So in order to study this, you need to study audiences, and we haven't actually done that for film. Like there is there's some attempts to doing this, but it hasn't been done. And what, what I would say, what we do know, is film was only important to the extent that there was a monopoly of information in communist Russia, right? So the state published all the newspapers and the state ran all the radio programming, right? So obviously under such conditions, all film all newspapers, all radio are propaganda in some sense because it's you cannot they cannot allow messages that there's that are against the regime to ever be carried through the airwaves, right? But cinema is only part of that, and I would say that it probably played a less important role than newspapers, schools radios and workplaces and things like that. So it was a secondary uh, place. It was more of confirming ideological biases than producing ideolo ideologies and subjects and so on and so forth. It, it's And also another thing that you point out is that you also had a very large foreign film market in Soviet Russia. That So it wasn't Soviet citizens which as you show the the popularity in film just from ticket sales is quite enormous um um and they're they're you know replaying in the mid 30s you know old uh, tarzan films from the 1920s that are incredibly important and you also point out too i think it was uh eisenstein's battleship potemkin compared to you know i i don't i can't remember if it was a tarzan yeah, film the, or something a robin hood movie yeah robin with hood douglas fairbanks yes which is not my piece of data. It's from uh, Richard Taylor, who's researched that, and others have researched that about the 20s. Yes, so there's, so again, so there's a monopoly of information, right? So people often assume, and that is true, that films, foreign films, were no longer imported past 1930. So 1930 importation stops, basically, and then there are few, very few films like Chaplin's Modern Times that are imported as an exception. But this doesn't mean that Soviet, audi Soviet audiences do not have access to foreign films because the theaters are not under control of the government. There's no centralized control of exhibition, right? So in theater network, um, it is run by municipalities, by you know, enterprises, by any, any, any kind of uh, organization could run it and theaters. And so the, some of these are still interested in making money. And so in order to make money, they show entertainment films, old foreign and Russian entertainment films. So it is, that's what's happening in the 30s, at least. And then in the 40s, after Russia goes, Russian forces go, go through Germany, they apprehend these so-called trophy films. So they collect an entire library of foreign films that are from the Czech Republic, uh, Hungary, and so on, but most importantly from America, Germany, and Britain. And then they decide in the for later 40s, starting from about 47, to release some of these films that are ideologically not entirely against um, this socialism uh, to the screens. 
And there, so again, there's ex, there's accessibility of foreign films uh, that's there, and there are arguments, and we can talk about it. Arguments that are made about why that happens, but the most obvious reason is there simply isn't there aren't movies to show, and so they have to fill the screen with something that is not offensive to the regime, but is still bringing people to the theater because the idea that cinema is the most important of the arts, that you can in principle use it as this very powerful propaganda weapon is still on the table. It's just they haven't been able to fulfill that mission, but that mission is still available. Yeah, this is one of the the really striking things early on in your book, and that is just the the collapse of Soviet film output uh, in the 1930s. I mean, the the pre-war output film... uh, out film output fell from over a hundred in 1929 to 40 in 1941, and then in 1951 it was less than 10 films, per, you know, Soviet produced films. So how do you um, how do you account for this really deep drop in filmmaking in the Stalin period? So there are there's three <laughs> there are three mistakes that Stalin made. Like there are three main reasons why that happens. So one of the main reasons is there is a disconnect or conflict between the base and the superstructure. Or you could say between the aspiration of the Stalinist regime and the practical reality on the ground, right? So the superstructure or the aspiration or the state policy, you could say, um, is that the Soviet Union will produce a large number of high-quality films carrying socialist ideology. And all three are important. Large number, high quality, and ideology, Okay. So that's the aspiration. The base or the practice of how things are run on the ground in the film industry, and this is the key finding of the book, is that the Soviet film industry was not equipped to make a large number of high-quality films carrying socialist ideology. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't able to do that. So Hollywood at the time, this is 1930s, is able to do that. It's, a, it's an industry that is very well organized. It um, employs thousands of people who are highly specialized, innovative craftsmen. And uh, there's, there's censorship, but the censorship is very clear and they're somewhat constrained by, not, not so much by censorship, but you can say by what uh, is acceptable to a very broad spectrum of American society, right? So large number of high qual- good quality, let's not say high, good quality films that are acceptable ideologically, okay? That's what Hollywood is making, and that's what Soviet Hollywood should be, but it never becomes that, because the Soviet film industry is not structured as Hollywood. So first of all, there are no producers, right? And so what what, what happens is that in the Soviet film industry, all the processes of production, we're talking from story ideas, of what should the film be about, to the editing of the finished film is essentially the whole process of production is essentially run by the film directors and or at least the large portion of it is run by the film directors uh, other professions are also severely restricted and in specifically there are very few good screenwriters so when uh, in hollywood you have about 300 screenwriters at the minimum during this time, in Russia, there are like 20 screenwriters who are who just work for the screen, okay? And so the ambition is that Russian cinema functions as Soviet Hollywood, but it is run, as, as I say, an artisan's workshop. It is not industrialized, it is not specialized, it is not diversified. Everything is organized and, and depends on the film director. And that's a major bottleneck to how many films you can actually produce. You simply cannot, that system is not able to produce many films. And that's one of the reasons that production never grows, let's say. Okay. So, but the rest of the story is why does it actually drop? And so here I would say that happened. There are two things that happen. So Stalin wants a large number of high quality films. So the high quality requirement expresses itself in two ways. One way it expresses itself is that Soviet critics, official Soviet critics writing for Soviet newspapers and other official taste makers of which Stalin is the main one, 
have very low tolerance for low quality films. <laughs> Kind so of whenever, snobs. <laughs> right. So whenever the Soviet filmmakers produce films that do not answer to this idea of superior quality, and it's about superior quality because the Soviet Union is supposed to be this great experiment, do it, and everything it does is superior to the West, including films. Right. So there's that ideological idea there. So whenever Soviet filmmakers produce low quality films, or what the films that are not superior to the West. They are severely criticized, shamed, and some of the films get banned. Because the criticism is so severe, everyone within the film industry, filmmakers, studio heads, censors, do not even want to come close to any material that would, be, would produce a film that is similar to the one that has just been criticized. And so very quickly, what happens in the 30s uh, is that, and it explains, it's the main reason that explains the decline, entire types of films, entire genres of films get, become too risky to even attempt to make. Very quickly in the 30s, contemporary, jo- contemporary dramas and comedies become too risky in that If you make one of those, you will make some mistakes and you will be severely criticized and your film might be banned and everyone will feel bad and resources will be, uh, you know, wasted. So don't come close. So so you're restricting the type of film that is even conceivable to make. And you're also creating a situation where it's too risky to make films. And so the whole industry basically contracts to control for this risk, to be, they, they all become too risk averse. And so they just make fewer and fewer films because it's risky to make films, especially films on uh, like, you know, comedies and dramas. And then the other thing that happens is <laughs> the requirement of high quality stands, right? And so you have Stalin decides that who is going to produce high-quality films? High-quality films be produced by masters, by director masters. And so instead of um, promoting an army of new directors who would have to make a few films before they get to the point where they can make high-quality films, he says, we want to allow masters like Eisenstein to make films. In fact, there's a story in 19... uh, 37, when the Minister of Cinema suggests to Stalin that Eisenstein should be fired because his film had just been banned. Stalin says, no, give Eisenstein a chance. Okay? Or when the, the minister uh, tells the Central Committee in 1933 that he only has very few directors that are capable of producing high-quality films, they tell him, fire the rest of the directors and entrust production only to these quality directors. The problem is these quality directors are the avant-gardists, are the formalists from the 20s. And so it's this, it becomes this kind of, again, there's this like bottleneck. So you're further restricting how many films can be produced when you say you're going to only allow these particular individuals, and there are lists of these individuals to make films. And these are the very individuals who do not care about ideology and care about the art of film and like their standing on the world stage of cinema a lot more than they care about Stalinism. Okay, so you have poorly, so you have a bad, you have an industry that is not supportive of mass production of films. You are also restricting what kinds of films are even possible. And then you are not allowing any new talent to develop in the industry because you are just have to have these great movies now. And then also too, you, you, you point out, I think, it, I think when Eisenstein was making even on the terrible, that it, it the, perf, the, the, the stakes for perf, perfection are so high that it just delay. It takes longer and longer right, to make exactly. these films. Yeah. So if they make the film, they take a lot of care to do it slowly and carefully and run it through 20 sensors to make sure it doesn't fail. And it still fails because Stalin, nobody can match Stalin's intuition. <laughs> nobody knows what Stalin is thinking. And so he can arbitrarily 
just say this film is a go, even though every censor in the country has said it wasn't, or say this film is no good, even though every censor in the country has signed on to it. So in addition to this, you create the system, and I write about this in one of the, the, in the chapter on censorship, you create a system where no one but Stalin can be trusted to make the final decision. So the censors are ineffective, risk averse and ineffective. It's very hard to make films when you don't know what you're doing. And everything you've been doing for years could overnight just s- turn around and you, you can not, you are not, you don't, you don't trust yourself. You don't trust the filmmakers. Uh, the filmmakers don't trust themselves. So it's, it's just that that's what happens. And it's, it's about poorly structured production process that isn't supportive of mass production. And it's this intol what I call an intolerance of imperfection that exists from the top or from the critics that constrict these two constrict severely constrict the production that's happening so what what is a uh, i mean cuz so part of the problem is institutional and then the other problem is ideological because everyone is expected to produce ideologically sound films but nobody's really clear on what that ideology is so what are some of the things that prevented that would be a considered a mistake in a film and and lead to either it being having to be changed or banned so there's a story that i uh talk about uh in the in the book of a film uh made in 1946 called um the great life by shai jism it's a part 2 so it's a sequel to a highly successful film made uh before the war under the same name, so Great Life uh, Part 1. It's a film about the Donbass miners, just the life. It's a contemporary drama of the life of the Donbass miners, and it's, you know, has songs. It's just a really great entertainment film, and at the same time, it completely uh, works for the policy at the time. So it's a very successful film. And so when in 1945, when Russia is still... um, is is 1945 when production is starting to recover after the war they move to mass film moves to moscow they decide to make this film a sequel to this film by the same director with the same actors now uh about the um restoration of the mine that was in the territories that were occupied by the germans and so the mine was destroyed uh, so this is so it's a more contemporary story about how a mine is restored after the war. Now, everybody loved the film. The whole film industry loved the film. All the censors passed the film. Uh, the film had, of course, been successful. It, you know, six years earlier, that same you know similar story was successful. So the film is made. Everyone is happy, and then Stalin watches it, and Zhdanov watches it. And there's an article that appears in newspaper Pravda that it's a false representation of Soviet reality. Now, what are, what are the problems with the film? First of all, in the film, uh, the characters start to reconstruct their mind practically by hand. Because all the equipment has been lost, it's a devastated area, people have little to eat, So, but they're dedicated... Uh, individuals, so they start to reconstruct the mine by hand. So what does Stalin say? This is not appropriate. We are a strong industrialized country. We don't restore everything by hand. Restoration of mines is something that is an organized, state-controlled, well-equipped process. What are the Westerners going to, in the West, if they see this film, what are they going to think about us? So that's one of the, like, how is something like this done when it's done in a realistic way by hand, which is what happened, right? That cannot be released in the West or in, in, even in the country because the idea is that, of course, we're doing this in a very equipped uh, and a very uh, well-organized uh, kind of process. Another problem with the film was that there was too much drinking and singing. And although everybody thought at the time, the filmmakers thought that, of course, we just won the war against Germans. We can certainly dance and sing and and form romantic couples and all of this. Stalin said too much drinking, too much singing. The Soviet people don't behave this way. They should not behave this way. Okay, that was number two. And the um, the last problem with the film was that 
uh, there were several individuals, characters in the film, who worked under the German occupation, including working as coll collaborators, German collaborators. S one of them was a collaborator under um, uh, in disguise, so he was actually a partisan, a you know, a person working for for the Soviets undercover as a collaborator. Okay, and this was clearly explained in the film. And so Stalin said, "You cannot have enemies of the uh, enemies who collab our enemies of the state who collaborate with the Germans be in a film as positive characters." Now, who would have predicted that after the war Stalin would turn around and call every single person who had some role in whatever role worked under the occupation to? call these people suspicious. Nobody was predicting that. Nobody knew that. But that was another mistake that the film made. And so these, on three, these three counts, the film was um, banned. I basically uh, come to the conclusion that there are three uh, images that censors, and Stalin in particular, um, cared about as represented in Soviet film. So you had to have a certain image of the Soviet person, dedicated, not drinking, uh, not, you know, uh, overly interested in romantic love. Uh, then the second image was this, uh, the image of the party uh, representative. So the party representative had to be pure, again, dedicated. Um, so there's that, and the image of the enemy. So the enemy uh, could not be um, smarter than the Soviet individuals. So there are all of these requirements. And so if the film... But this was not written anywhere. It's just my conclusion based on looking, having looked at many, many banned films and why they were banned. Those three are the three images that they cared about. But how a Soviet person should be portrayed, how a party member should be portrayed, how an enemy should be portrayed was not clear and changed, you know, year by year and was not, predict was not predictable. So you, could ne you never knew what would ban the film. I'm really surprised by the first one, which is the idea that the state, the industrialized state, isn't there to uh, rebuild. And here you have Soviet people rebuilding on their own initiative. To me, this sounds like right out of a socialist realist hero. <laughs> right. But this is the Cold War. OK. And Soviet Russia has to be portrayed as strong. So because Stalin just thinks that films like literally are taken literally that people abroad watching the films would literally believe what's in them as true. And so it had to represent certain things in a certain way. Now, talk about this, the fact that the, the, the Soviet film industry is so dominated by a, really a handful of masters. So how do they figure in all of this and how do they navigate these various unknowns to get their films made? Well, they, so it's a middle road they have to travel, right? On the one hand, they have to be able to make their films. And they're also, they haven't immigrated. So they, to some degree, they support the regime. So they have to make films that somewhat answer to, you know, what the Pravda editorials call for, right? So thematically, these films have to conform to some degree, right? So they understand that. On the other hand, all filmmakers, good filmmakers, make films for themselves and for their peers, okay? So a big portion, and, and this is something that has never been uh, addressed when talking about Soviet cinema. Everybody just assumes politics penetrates everything, but the fact that art also penetrates everything, at least for these people, that has not been argued. So they're making movies for themselves. They're making movies for Sergei Eisenstein. So Sergei Eisenstein is an international celebrity uh, a very well-known uh, filmmaker, a fantastic filmmaker. And so everyone who's making films under in Russia knows that Eisenstein is going to see their film. And it, so it ha they have to make sure their film is high quality and interesting to someone like Eisenstein or to their own peers. And at the same time, they need to pass the political censorship part of it. So they need to walk this middle line, right? And they do. And sometimes they fail and sometimes they don't. But because there's nobody else, they continue making films.
right? That's what's interesting. They just keep they they make a mistake, the film gets banned, but they get keep on getting commissions to make new films. Yeah, and there's always this idea that you know there were purges, people were uh, you know killed under Stalin. Well, there's actually there's no filmmaker who was, as far as I know, there's no filmmaker who was killed under Stalin or arrested even under Stalin for a film. Like there are screenwriters and filmmakers who were arrested and killed, many, but not because of a film they made, but because of a relative, because of somebody, you know, denounced them or something like that, or because of their literary work, not because of their filmmaking. And that is because the film industry is very thin. There's very little talent. And I think he, Stalin knows that. Everybody knows that. Now, now you've, you've mentioned repeatedly the importance of high quality film. So what, what does it mean, high quality? It, this idea of Soviet superiority, this is not my idea. This comes from uh, Michael David Fox's book, um, The Showcase in the Great Experiment. So th- this idea that Soviet society uh, has to be superior um, morally and in other respects to um, Western societies because the communist system is a better system or enlightened system than capitalism. Okay, so... This is where I think this high quality idea comes from, that it has to be. So your films are not only should not only be propaganda, they have to be gorgeous propaganda or they have to be effective propaganda. So it's this idea. And and this is where Stalin comes up with this idea of a masterpiece. So at some point in the 40s, they realize that the industry is unable to make more films. They keep asking for it, but they can't get it. And so then at some point late in the 40s, they decide, okay, our competitive advantage is that our films are better. Maybe there are only five of them, but they're better. Okay. And so it's just that they have this high quality requirement in place, this idea that we're going to make only masterpieces because we are a better country, a better society, and our filmmakers will at some point you know, make masterpieces that continue. And it's a completely unrealistic idea. It's a completely unrealistic idea. Stalin just thinks that somehow this could happen because it's a better regime, but it never happens. In fact, the more films you produce, the more likely you are to produce masterpieces. And the fewer films you produce, the less likely you are to produce masterpieces. But, but what, what's wonderful about this high quality requirement is that this allows Eisenstein and the like, to survive, to keep making films, to keep justifying their films on artistic grounds. We're making high-quality films on artistic grounds. We're showing that Soviet cinema is great. We're showing that there's creative freedom, right? Because you can't have, you know, you need to have creative freedom too. So there's, part of it is this idea that it's a better society, so you're going to have Eisensteins, you're going to have film masterpieces, and that 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 continues to inform uh, how films are made and how decisions are made for the film industry. Throughout, it seems Hollywood plays a kind of a constant comparative role in their minds, right? In terms of trying to aspire to produce as many films as Hollywood, produce better films than Hollywood. So where does Hollywood stand in the imagination of Soviet filmmakers at the time? So uh, so Soviet filmmakers compare themselves directly to Hollywood. Because to Soviet filmmakers, there are as much Russian artists, or Russian Stalinist artists, you can even say, as they are contributing to the world film process. And that is because Russia was on the world map of film uh, in the 1920s. In fact, it was on the top of this map. Films that were coming out of Russia were considered the most innovative films in the world. And so... Given this, they continue to compare themselves to Hollywood, which is the best equipped, the best, innova- the most innovative industry uh, in uh, the 30s. The other thing is that Hollywood is mass producing films and uh, spreading capitalist ideology all over the world. And so ideally, the Russians wanted that same industry and an ability to spread communists all over the world through their films. And the big irony is that they never get there um, 
but that that's the aspiration. And there is a specific uh, moment when they were very close to getting to Soviet Hollywood, and they they fail. So in 1935, the Minister of Cinema, uh, Boris Shumyatsky, uh, is sent uh, with Stalin's blessing to a tour of Western film industries, and he spends uh, about two months in Hollywood. He comes back with this plan to reform the Soviet film industry uh, based on the Hollywood model, that there would be producers, uh, mil- you know, s- thousands of screenwriters, uh, dedicated cinema actors, many, many directors, and so on and so forth, that the process would be um, exactly equivalent to Hollywood. And he even comes up with the idea of building a cine city or film city uh, in the south of Russia. This project is in the works. Everybody believes in it. Filmmakers love it for a year and a half or so. And then 1936 happens. Uh, In 1936, Stalin apparently realizes that that Soviet Union is on its own, that there is a coming war in Europe. And in this war, uh, Japan, America, Britain... Uh, France, and so on, the Western world, is not going to stand on the side of Russia. And so he starts introducing restrictive policies, and part of this, so the Great Terror is part of this restrictive policy. And he also decides that Russia has to walk its own way, that Russia cannot rely on foreign technology, on foreign ideas, to build socialism. And because the idea of Soviet Hollywood is entirely, (laughs) emphatically, enthusiastically based based on the Hollywood model, he abandons it. He decides it's no longer a good deal. It's no longer Russian. And then you can see this through newspapers. Newspapers start writing about Soviet Hollywood as a foreign uh, idea. And he ends up actually... um, allowing the film minister who proposed the idea to be executed during the, uh, the Great Terror. And so the, the, this prospect of actually, that was on paper, it was like the foundations were laid for the sinister city, this prospect of turning the Soviet film industry into a mass-producing Soviet Hollywood fail because of when it happens and because what is happening internationally and what is happening in Stalin's head uh, and per- his perceptions of how the world works change. And so the project gets closed, and then the film industry never uh, reforms and continues to operate in this very artisanal way to the end. Now, now after this you know, two-decade period of just the decline of, of Soviet film production, it re- begins to recover in 51 and then reaches, in a couple of years, reaches its you know, pre-1930 levels. So what changed in that period that allowed more film production? So I have not studied this period, but it's just just projecting from what I do know in the under Stalin is that there are two things happen. One, a very important thing happens, new talent enters the industry. There's simply, so all of these filmmakers, while they're not making films, these 20s filmmakers who work under Stalin, they make very few films. They're all teaching at the Moscow Film School. And they're generating a new generation of highly (laughs) well-trained, young people with ideas. And whenever you have an influx of young people into the industry, you get more films and better films. And that's what happens after Stalin dies. They just allow these people to enter and start making films. Um, And the other thing that happens, Stalin created an incredibly... Um, un- an incredible uncertainty in the system. Like we discussed, you never knew what's going to happen to your film. Uh, so once Stalin dies, that institution of uncertainty dies as well. So censorship becomes much more predictable. And so you now know how to make get your film through. And you can, if, if several 20 people have said the film is a go, it is actually going to be a go. And so it beco- the whole system becomes much better, much more reliable much more transparent, and there's all this new talent. So, of course, you're going to have a better better production. 
And and finally, um, I found it interesting. Your conclusion begins with an epigraph from um, the great historian Sheila Fitzpatrick, and it reads: "Even in Stalin's Russia, policy instructions should never be confused with outcomes." It's it's a great great reminder, I think, for all of us who look at this period. So, how does this statement apply to your understanding of? Film well, that's Stalin? precisely the problem with the standard story of Soviet cinema was that outcomes were uh, taken to be. Uh, intentions of policy intentions. So we should. So one one idea here in my book is that we should never assume that just because Stalinism was a repressive regime, repression was the only logic that operated under Stalin. And I think that was assumed for many many years. And people still will not accept my book because I don't argue that. So uh, don't assume that just be. Also don't assume because that, that's that wasn't the case. And the reason there's uh, the the publisher w- suggested that I put Stalin on the cover of my book, and I said no. I want a film minister on the cover of my book who is smiling because I want it's a different story. When you're actually inside this industry, it's a different story. Yes, there's repression. Yes, there's fear, but it's not the only thing that happens. So so don't assume also that just because very few films were produced, so the outcome is very few films that that was actually what was intended. What I discovered is Stalin wanted a large number of high-quality films, right? Uh, That's what the policy was. But the outcome, which was a small number of propagandistically questionable films, uh, was never intended. And it resulted from steps that were taken uh, to build certain institutions and to structure incentives under Stalin, right? But these steps were never intended to stop production of entire genres of films or to prevent people for new talent from entering the industry, right? So these steps were taken for ideological reasons or for reasons of short, short-sightedness, you can say, um, but they were never meant to, to const- constrain the industry. And so that's, that's the idea here. So we, we, j- we have to look at, you have to operate on the level between policy and films to figure out what this story actually was. Yeah. No, I mean, this is a thing, and and what I really liked about your book is that you really pay attention to institutions because with our assumption that, you know, because the the Soviet government or Stalin himself says, I want X – we we tend to think that the you know the institutions work <laughs> and and what you what you really show is that the problem of soviet film production is far more an institutional problem than it is say an ideological one yes exactly so ideology is important because they abandon the soviet hollywood project because of ideological for ideological and political reasons but because they abandon it they never build the industry they want and because they don't have the institutions they want they never can achieve the outcomes that they want so it's like ideology is important stalin is important but stalin does not see 15 years in, in ahead stalin is not realistic in what he assumes and um yeah so it's it's you have to look at day-to-day operations to see and Stalin doesn't doesn't see what the outcome is going to be. Yeah, so that's not. So he might he might have goals and reasons to do what he does, very good ones. I mean, from his perspective, but he doesn't um, know what the outcome would be, and the outcome has to do with institutions. That was Maria Bella Dubrovskaya speaking to Sean Gillery for SRB podcast. I've been a fan of SRB for years and I was just thrilled when Sean gave me the go-ahead to share this episode with you. I just love the breadth of topics Sean discusses with his guests. In one episode, he'll be tackling epic scale questions like why did the Soviet Union collapse? And then in another, he'll be exploring the story of a single individual person, as he did with the episode on Frederick Bruce Thomas, an African-American who established a hugely successful nightclub in Moscow in the first decade of the 20th century. You can find SRB podcasts wherever you get your podcasts, and there are over 350 episodes for you to enjoy. I'd also highly recommend Maria Bella Dubrovskaya's book, Not According to Plan, Filmmaking Under Stalin, which is published by Cornell University Press. It's available from all good booksellers. Sure, your local bricks and mortar bookshop may not have it in stock, but they can almost certainly get you a copy. Okay, as promised, 
Here's a brief update on what's happening with Roos Files Unite. For a variety of reasons, I haven't been able to record new episodes of the show for the last few months. And to be honest, I don't see that situation changing anytime soon. I sincerely hope that I'll be able to revive the show at some point, but I figured that during what's likely to be an extended hiatus, I could use the feed to share with you some podcasts that I've enjoyed over the years that have a connection to the movies we've covered on the show or to Russian and Soviet cinema more generally. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed what I've been doing with this show, the best thing you can do to support it is to let other people you think would like it know that it exists. If you'd like to get in touch, you can find Roos Files Unite on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. I'm also on Letterboxd and my username is Ali underscore. That's A-L-L-Y underscore. Thank you so much for listening and... That's for Daniel, folks.